Good morning. Uh, thanks for joining us. My name's Simon. Uh, I, I work uh, for a firm called Xavia, and I'm here with my colleague, Aaron. Uh, our other colleague and collaborator is Adil. He unfortunately couldn't make it today in person, but you'll hear from him later via pre-recorded section of the presentation. Uh, in this talk, we're going to give you an overview of some work we did incorporating two of our products into a human-in-the-loop machine learning tool. But first, uh, a little bit about Xavia. Uh, we're a B Corp based in Philadelphia, focusing on geospatial technology for civic, social, and environmental impact. We also have a strong commitment to open source software and try to contribute to the open source geospatial community whenever possible. All right, so uh, in order to motivate what we're doing here, I'm gonna walk through a little hypothetical scenario. So let's say that you just got hired as a short order cook at a diner. But here's the problem, you have no idea how to cook at all. I guess you're persuasive because uh, you talked yourself into this job, but you got no idea how to work griddle. In fact, the only thing you really know how to cook is toast. Um, you'll be working breakfast, but really, how useful are you if that's all you can do? Um, so you get to the, the diner and you meet Mike. He's the veteran cook who's gonna train you. You explain the situation to Mike and he's like, well, just when you think you've seen everything, right? So I can do my best to teach you today, but we're, we gotta make the most of it because you're on your own tomorrow. Um, so he teaches you how to make some stuff and then the customers start showing up. It's getting busy and the orders are rolling in. You've had a quick lesson, so you kinda know how to make these dishes, but you're far from an expert. So you need to use these orders as learning experiences and make the most of them in the time you've got this morning. Now, you're not gonna be able to make every order, so how do you choose which dishes you're gonna cook? You've got some options on the best way to go about this. You and Mike could just take turns grabbing whatever random order gets printed out. So this may be a decent approximation of what tomorrow's shift will look like when you're working alone, but again, you gotta make the most of this training time, and if you do this, you'll probably spend too much time working on the tasks like toast that you don't need practice in. No, you would want to choose the dishes that you're least confident in. in. You want to be making one dish, and then once it's done, you come over to Mike for another assignment. He'll look over the options, find one that you need the most work on, and say, here you go, go make pancakes. And you do it, then you bring the pancakes back to Mike. He'll look at it. If you nailed it, maybe he'll send you off to make French toast because you haven't done that yet. But if you screwed up, he'll explain what you did wrong and send you back to make another order of pancakes. So uh, why am I talking about this? Why am I talking about breakfast at this a software conference? Um, I'm talking about this because this approach that we just decided on is the same approach that human in the loop machine learning uses. So a human in the loop AI system, which is also sometimes referred to as active learning, and I will uh, shorten to HIDL for the purposes of this presentation, is one in which a human is involved in an iterative training process or a loop uh, with the AI model. So this approach is appealing because it promises the harmony of the efficiency of the machine with the nuance of a human. Um, so we start by labeling a small amount of randomly selected data. This is the initial training set. Uh, we use this to train a basic model. The model comes back with predictions of varying confidence levels. So we focus on confirming or correcting some of the predictions that the model is least confident in then add those corrected labels back to the training set. So now, the training set is not only larger, but it's more diverse. We've targeted our input specifically to fill in gaps in the model. So to tie a bow on our diner metaphor before we leave it behind, in this case, Mike is the human, you are the AI model. The training process happens when you cook food. Your low confidence predictions are the dishes you bring to Mike for inspection and he corrects, corrects the outputs by telling you what you did wrong. So why use this Hiddle approach? So the first reason is efficiency. Um, there's no sort of shortage of imagery out there. The limiting factor is usually a lack of ground truth, good ground truth labels. And of course the process of labeling imagery is expensive. So one way to think of an active learning approach is as a method of simply speeding up the process of human labeling. So let's consider the two images here. On the left is an image that you would need to label from scratch. 
And on the right is the same image with predictions that you would be correcting in a HIDL context. So the active learning case is much quicker because the model's already done some of the work for you. Yeah, you'll likely need to adjust, delete, and add some labels, but it's certainly much quicker to label the image um, than which is, has to correct the image than to annotate every car from scratch. So this approach offer also offers the potential for model transparency. Here we've got the predictions from a first round of training. You can see that the label modeled, uh, the model labeled one car correctly, but it also thinks that a lot of different rectangular formations on top of the roof are cars, which they're not. Um, in a traditional approach, the model would just happily carry on, labeling skylights and HVAC rooftop unit units as cars but this approach allows the human to peek into what the model is doing and say, like, that's not bad, but here are some ways you could do better in the future. Uh, a third benefit is that it can help find edge cases. So in this example, we've got a piece of construction equipment and what looks like to be some sort of shed, both of which are car-like enough for the model to be confused. So it stands to reason that these will be the predictions that the model will be least confident in. So they'll be presented to the human to confirm or correct, therefore increasing the likelihood that it will be able to correctly classify the next piece of construction equipment or the next shed. And uh, we were interested in this approach because we do a lot of work applying computer vision to geospatial imagery. And as part of that work, we've developed these two different tools, groundwork and raster vision, which are foundational to this project. Uh, groundwork is uh, an imagery, imagery labeling tool for geospatial imagery. It's designed for creating training data for machine learning tasks. It has an open source API which includes the active learning implementation that we're discussing today. And it works such that users upload imagery to groundwork which breaks it into manageable chunks of work called tasks. Then users can collaboratively label and validate imagery before exporting the label in stack catalogs. RasterVision uh, is a library for deep learning on geospatial imagery. It's fully open source and built on top of open source libraries like GDAL, NumPy, and PyTorch. And if you're interested in contributing, we certainly encourage you to reach out. So it enables geospatial developers to bypass much of the tedious data processing tasks associated with machine learning. They can pass in geospatial data in formats like GeoTIFF and GeoJSON, train a model, and get predictions back in the same familiar formats. RasterVision handles everything in between. And it's particularly easy to work with RasterVision in conjunction with Groundwork uh, because both of these tools read and write stack catalogs. So pulling the two tools together in a HIDL context, we label imagery in Groundwork, which stores the imagery with the labels. When a user kicks off a job via the Groundwork UI, it takes the imagery and labels and uses raster vision to train a model and make predictions on the unlabeled imagery before sending those predictions back to groundwork where we use the UI for human validation. As predictions are validated, they get stored as labels. And then after some validation, the user can kick off another job starting the loop again. So at this point, I'm gonna turn it over to Aaron to demo the app. Thank you, Simon. So yeah, let's play the video. Uh, suppose you have a project in Groundwork and you want to create some training data set for cars from the satellite image in here. So you start labeling. Here, you have a bunch of tools to help you trace the objects on the map. So when you are done labeling for this current task, simply click on the confirm button and it will submit the labels for you. And if you see none of your like, you know, object of interest, which in this case cars in here, you can just submit and it will not ask you to like, label it again. And here, uh, we have a bunch of tools for you. For example, you can trace the cars by uh, dropping vertices or by continuously moving your mouse. It, is, it works the same way. Since this is, you know, semantic segmentation, you would probably want pixel perfect or somewhat pixel perfect like labels. So the tool does exactly that. It cuts out the part of the labels that fall outside of the current task grid so you have a good quality of training data set. 
So when you're done labeling for this current round, um, only with just a few labels, of course, there's this predict button on top of the task map to let you do predictions. It kicks off a human the loop process that takes in the labels you just drew and trains our active learning model under the hood. And this was done in just a few minutes with an in-app notification. And in here, it gives you predictions uh, uh, already created, some like pretty nice predictions with just a few label input. And now you may want to start labeling or like validating these predictions again. And this is just after three rounds of training and prediction and validating. So now you're in the validation queue. Under the hood, the tasks in this validation queue are ordered in a way such that you will be focusing on the part of the image that the model is most uncertain about. What does it mean? It means HIDL will like, you know, leave the heavy lifting to the active learning model under the hood and will reduce your uh, you know, uh, 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 labeling capacity or reduce your labeling effort. So at this point, you want to pause and you want to start a new round of prediction, that's also fine. And you are the human, and this is the loop built into the uh, groundwork application. And now um, I will pass it to Adil, who is uh, not here, unfortunately, today, but he recorded a pretty nice video to talk you guys through the deep dive of machine learning. Okay. Does the uh, audio work? Uh, okay, the audio is not working. Um, all right, so I'm going to walk through Adil's portion, given that the audio isn't uh, is working. But uh, this is going to so let's start off with that conceptual image and take a closer look. Now we'll note that apart from the labels, it also takes in as input the entire groundwork task grid, and apart from the predictions as you just saw, it also outputs priority scores for all the tasks in the task grid that basically help you prioritize which areas of the image to label next. With that in mind, we can proceed to take a closer look inside the black box and see how the magic happens. The first step is to train a model, specifically a neural network. Now, geospatial scenes are usually too large to fit all at once into a neural network, so we'll first need to break it down into smaller training chips. We also want to be careful about sampling those training chips only from the parts of the image that we have actually labeled. Now, RasterVision, the library that we're using for this, is well equipped to handle all of this and makes it fairly trivial. And you can see here what the process looks like at a high level. Now, all of this is pretty far of the course for geospatial machine learning. However, it is worth mentioning that there are some machine learning considerations that only come into play with this kind of active learning workflow. The first of these considerations is the starting point of your model weights. In each round, as you add more labels, you will have to update your model. And to do that, you'll have a choice of whether to create a brand new model and train it from scratch, or to pick up your model from the last round and continue training it with new data. Now, we found that the second approach works better in practice. However, it does have the potential disadvantage that if the model learns something incorrect in earlier rounds, it might not be able to unlearn it in later rounds. The second major consideration is your sampling approach to sampling training chips. Now, one thing to note is that your pool of available data is not static throughout training. Um, in fact, it grows with each round as you add more labels. And so you probably want to increase the number of training chips that you use in each round to take advantage of that. That's what we're doing currently. We currently scale up the number of training chips linearly with the number of label tasks. Another sampling consideration is, especially if you're using the same model in each round, is, is that it will get exposed to some parts of the image more often than the others. And so you might want to strike a balance on how often it sees old data versus new data. Thirdly and finally, uh, we've made a big deal about sampling only from the parts of the image that are labeled. However, believe it or not, the unlabeled por portions are not entirely useless. In fact, in the past few years, a lot of research has gone into techniques like self-supervised and semi-supervised learning that are able to squeeze out useful training information, even from parts, even from data that is not labeled. And using those techniques with this kind of human in the loop workflow could prove to be a powerful combination and is exciting to think about. 
Regardless of how you choose to train, you will end up with a model. Well, not this model, probably something a million times larger, but a model all the same. And the next thing you'll want to do is to run this model over the entire scene to produce predictions, which at the most basic level will look something like this. Now, what this is, is a raster or two-dimensional array of pixel probabilities, where the value of each pixel represents how likely it is to be part of a car. Brighter regions here correspond to higher values, darker regions are lower values, and the transparent regions are values that are so low that they're basically zero. With that in mind, we can see that the model is more or less getting it correct, except for a few interesting mistakes, which we'll get back to in a moment. But first, at this point, we are ready to produce the first one of our two main outputs, that is prediction polygons. And to do that, we can simply threshold this image using a value of, let's say, 0.5 to get something like this. We can, we can then take all, all these contiguous regions, convert them into polygons, and ship, ship it off to groundwork, where these will show up as predictions on the map, as you, as you saw in the demo. Now, getting back to pixel probabilities, we can take a closer look at some of the areas that the model is struggling with. We can see, for example, that it is a little uncertain about those cars on the right side of the road that are partially hidden in the trees. It is also mistaking some of the vents on rooftops with cars, as well as a small round object on the left sidewalk near the top of the image that is clearly not a car. Now, now these are exactly the kind of areas that we want to prioritize for human correction. And to do that, we would want to apply some kind of transformation that would take these sort of middling values that, that is not too high and not too low and assign them the highest scores. To do that, we use the entropy function from information theory that does exactly this. Note, however, that this is not the only way to define uncertainty. We could, for example, train multiple models, make predictions from each of those models and, and, and then take those areas where the models most disagree and categorize them as the most uncertain areas. But that is obviously very expensive to do. So anyway, once we have these uncertainty scores at the pixel level, the final step is to realize that we cannot expect a human to go pixel by pixel correcting them. So what we want to do is aggregate them to a less granular level. To do that, we simply take the average. So if you imagine this to be a single groundwork task, the priority score for that task would then just be an average of all the values that you see here. And this completes the second one of our two outputs, that is the priority scores. And now we're ready to zoom back out of the machine learning black box and take a more holistic view of how all of this comes together. Awesome. So <clears throat> let's take a look at how we engineer this under the hood. So we engineer this workflow by combining our open source APIs with the cloud infrastructure for productivity. So you can create any number of training data to get the model started. The labels are then sent through our APIs and are then persisted to our open source PostGIS and Postgres database. So when you start a new prediction run um, in Groundwork, the APIs under the hood, they submit a new job to AWS Batch. So this job is like a snapshot of all your uh, image data and your label data, and it contains all the information needed for the machine learning down the line. So the batch process, of course, then would submit a new job to our configured compute environment, which has a fleet of instances ready to take your input uh, and then do some predictions on them. So each of these GPU-enabled instance would pull the HIDL container from the registry and then it'll take the snapshot of your input data and then run a custom raster vision active learning model under the hood to give you some training and predictions. So of course, during the training and predictions and among these iterations, we persist the, um, you know, the, the learning artifacts to S3 storage so that the model can learn from the previous iterations as well. So this asynchronous workflow produces two major products, as mentioned before, the uh, prioritized task grid and the prediction labels. These are pretty critical for you to make further decisions when you're validating these predictions. So these data are then persisted 
through our API um, to groundwork to the backend. And when this is done, as demoed before, um, you will get an in-app notification of, okay, you have these predictions, now you want to validate. So from here, you can validate these predictions based off of the uh, model suggestions. So you can create your own edits on top of them, and your own edits are your, are your own copy of the uh, labels, and the predictions are the predictions. They do not affect each other. So here, you are ready to go for another round in the loop until you're happy about the training data set. And now let's see some quick results. So um, as you can see in this area, the predictions got improved like round by round. So let's say like example car number one. So the model started with some very initial predictions in this case, and it then gradually like, you know, uh, have like fuller annotations after some human validations in later rounds. And let's look at example car number two and three in here. These are the cars under the tree branches. And, and as you can see, um, the model predicted better in later rounds with some human involvement as well. So the predictions, they also tend to converge to a more stable version of the predictions themselves in terms of the shape in later rounds. And this can be seen in all of these labels and especially in label number, f uh, label, label number four. So this shows that with some proper uh, human intervention in between of just a few uh, machine learning uh, you know, iterations and some like, you know, very little training data set, the resulting training data set has already a pretty good quality. So we do plan to improve this entire workflow and we want to enhance the in-app um, experience um, as, long, uh, as well as the uh, machine learning under the hood. And if you're interested to know more or talk to us after this talk, we're happy to uh, show you more. So we hope this presentation sounded interesting to you. And if you're interested in like, you know, working on these cool projects or products we're currently hiring, um, our CEO, Robert, who's also here in this talk and who's also going to be at 11, uh, booth 11 uh, throughout the entire conference. So please drop by if you want to talk to us directly as well. Our colleagues, Mike, who's also here today, um, and Daniel, <coughs> they are going to have a general track talk tomorrow in the same room at 9 a.m. <coughs> excuse me, about distributor and Topo Jason tomorrow, 9 a.m., the same room. And yeah, if you would like to, if you'd like to try this Hiddle uh, workflow out, please let us know. Uh, it is currently by request only, so if you're interested, you can send us an in-app message or to talk to us directly today, or you can scan the QR code here and, or take a photo to fill out the contact form. And also, if you'd like to try out uh, RasterVision, which is the machine learning tool under the hood, uh, please scan the code there because that's a GitHub -like link to that open source tool. And if you have any other questions, we're here today, and you can also submit your questions through the contact form on this QR code as well. Um, yeah, that's, that's it. Let's keep in touch. Thank you, guys.